and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to speak on this really important bill tonight. And I want to uh, congratulate my colleagues, colleague Deputy Emer Higgins for the extraordinary work that she's put in in developing this really important and comprehensive piece of legislation. I know that the effort that she's put into it has been technically astute, it's been, it's been deeply researched, not just for legislative purposes, but all of the work and all of the associated work around it, the comparative international analysis that she's gone through, the very deep discussion that she's had with women's representative groups, with business representative groups, and with the so very many allies outside this house who are trying to reach for a more equal society, particularly in business. And I really want to congratulate her for her extraordinary effort and work in that regard. It is such a, it is, it's so satisfying to now see that the government putting its weight behind this. It's so satisfying to see that she's ahead of the European Union in respect of their agreement. They proposed it back in 2012, but you produced the legislation. So congratulations to you, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak on this. I'm also so very pleased that there's so many male colleagues here to support Deputy Higgins and to support her important work. Um, it's, there's no point in groups that have been marginalised, whether it's women, though they're not a minority, they have been marginalised, or any other group, to have to fight to rectify that. They absolutely need allies at every turn. This is a house where there's a gender imbalance, even though it is a representative house, and it's so important that male colleagues turn up, and as they do tonight, and continue to turn up in support of equality and gender equality measures. Can I pay particular regard to uh, Deputy um, Neil Richmond, who correctly raises the hockey, but he does so without having mentioned the fact that he was the person in the, do in the, members, uh, bar, uh, uh, the members bar the other day advocating for that the Irish women's hockey team match be put on, when I hadn't known it was on or anything else, but it was Deputy Richmond, who both knew it was on, knew the significance of it, and was looking to try to, to get it put on. And to me, that's just a day-to-day -day example of standing up for Irish women, standing up for Irish sport, and it's an example of walking the walk instead of just coming in here and, and talking about it. The trouble is, of course, um, from a gender equality perspective, it is so tiresome to have to keep pointing out the very different historical experience of men and women and the very different contemporary, contemporary experience of men and women. It is so very tiresome to have to keep taking great big boots, as Deputy Higgins has had to do today, to take great big steps over decades of inequality, to have to, put, to have to point out the reasons why it's important, and to have to try to step around an effort not to apologise for it, as Deputy Higgins has done so carefully and so articulately today, to say that I don't need to apologise for this. Of course, these are on merit, but the background experience is X. It's so tiresome to have to continually point that out, and hopefully we'll get to a point where we've overcome the decades of um, the, the decades of experience that has built upon male name over male name over male name on boardroom walls, that has built over male photo over male photo over male photo over male photo in in C-suite um, uh, um, areas of, of business, because the cultural effect and the soft effects that those have are very excluding. They may not be intimidating, but they are excluding. Because what they speak to is a past where only men succeeded, where only men were scientists, where only men were capable of writing books, where only men were historians, where only men were political leaders, as though women had never had the capacity to do those things. Of course they had the capacity. They were just too busy dying in childbirth or rearing the children of that experience to be able to participate. That's if they had had the opportunity to be educated and if they'd had the opportunity to participate. So you build on those centuries and decades of exclusion. You build on those centuries and decades of pointing to male authorities in every academic subject where so many women were so capable. And the idea that it's somehow not directly replicated, either in business or in politics or in any other aspect of society, is just fallacy. And there's absolutely no need to apologise that we now have to take great big boots to step over those decades of historical inequality. It isn't difficult if you're a woman to identify the barriers that, uh, that, that Deputy Bruton has identified. They are soft and they are cultural, but they are day-to-day -day and they are real. I can give you a couple of examples. I have uh, friends who are partners in law firm and my, my friend is the first equity partner in her law firm and she's, she's very capable, very experienced. She's also a single mum and she has to work twice as hard to be able to turn up and do her job without, any, without anybody really taking account of that. But the recruitment, for, the recruitment process was, uh, she was saying, why, why am I the first, essentially? And they'd said, well, no woman really identified themselves as being interested before. And that just isn't possible. It just isn't true. That's just not true. It wasn't possible. It can't be possible that you can have more than 50% law students going into universities and more than 50% graduates coming out of the Law Society and the King's Inn and other places, and that none of them are interested in being an equity partner. 
What is happening in between those things? What are the cultural things that are happening? Uh, uh, Deputy McHugh is taking three minutes at the end. The, the cultural things that are happening are childbirth, child rearing, a differential treatment of men and women in terms of expectations in relation to care, a different treatment of men and women in terms of taking flexible working. I recall another situation of a very experienced um, professional friend of mine who was working in a, a professional services accountancy firm and she and her partner had had a second baby. And at that point, she looked to move to a three-day week from a five-day week. And I remember saying to her, oh, no, don't. The effect on your pension, the effect on your promotional opportunities, on your inclusion. But the obvious solution, of course, and I've said it before, was two four-day weeks. It simply wasn't culturally possible in a senior commercial organisation in Dublin, or anywhere else, by the way. Until it is possible for a man to go in and say, we've just had a second baby in a senior commercial position, I'd like to do a four-day week for the next three years. Until that's culturally normal then nothing is going to change. And the only way for that to be normal is to have women at boardroom level and at executive level right across the board so that their experience is normal and so that their seniority is normal having had that experience. And the only way to do that is to introduce legislation along the lines that Deputy Higgins has done. However, I'd point out one caveat, which is that it's not, there's no point in it being limited to non-executive directors. All of the power is at executive director level. All of the money all of the influence and all of the cultural influence is at executive director level. And I really think that's the place where we have to target. And it is not acceptable that it simply be non-executive positions. Deputy Higgins may leave this house in 30 years after a marvellous career and get a non-executive position. It's not enough. It's not enough. It's her comparator now who's in an organisation who should be in an executive position running the organisation. And she sets the tone for that. It's the cult, soft cultural experiences of having things, if you don't mind my saying, Cahir, like explained to you, having your own expertise explained to you. Deputy Higgins has had has her own expertise and her own professional background. Indeed, I have mine. And at least two times in the last three months, I've had pieces of my own academic writing explained to me by people who then admitted they hadn't read it. It is so annoying, but it happens all the time, and it only ever happens from a, from a male to a female. It sounds like a sort of a contentious, contrary point to make, but honest to God, it happens. And if it happens, to, if, it, if it happens in here, it, I can assure, and I'm sure Deputy Higgins would nod in agreement, it happens in every other organisation as well. And it is, one of the, it is one of the points that every women's organisation point out as being significant. So I want to congratulate, I want to share my time with Deputy uh, Jo McHugh and congratulate and thank Deputy Higgins for her work today and indeed her work that has gone into this over the last two years. Congratulations.